Greetings, preachers. Since I can't be with you in the classroom, these lessons are going to be an important part of your work in creating an exegetical sermon through the book of Philippians. And hopefully these will be skills that you'll be able to take and use in your preaching through the future. Uh, I just want to warn you, not everybody who preaches exegetically does every one of these steps. But my goal is for you to dive deeper into this biblical text. It's just going to be a short passage, but I want you to know this passage better than any Bible passage you've ever been with in your entire life. Over the next six weeks, you're going to study it forward and backward until it comes oozing out of your pores, until you find yourself dreaming about it as you lay in your bed at night, until you are there with Paul, with the Philippians, thinking, understanding, living that passage, and then thinking about, and really by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, coming to a place where you know how to apply that sermon into the lives of your listeners in a powerful, life-changing sermon. This is an incredible process, and I can tell you I've used all of these steps myself in preaching, and it is my favorite way to preach. There's just something about diving in deep. Now, we've already in class talked about the ways of doing observations. So now we're going to go to the next step. You've already begun to dive into the text. Now I want you to go a little bit deeper, and we're going to start by looking at the words themselves. first way we're going to do that is to look at the different ways Bible translators have translated the scriptures. Now, let me just say, if you've already had Greek, I'm going to give you a substitution. If you feel you're advanced enough, which I actually would recommend, if you haven't taken Greek, please do it. And you can do a diagrammatical analysis. If you're in your advanced Greek class have done this, I will accept that as a substitution for this parallel study because it gets you the same thing in actually a better sense because you're dealing with that original language. And what I'm looking for in a grammatical analysis is laying out the, the subject of the sentence, the main verb, objects, and then all the modifiers underneath. As long as I can understand what you're doing and see that you've got it, that's great. I'll accept that. But for everybody else, whether you haven't had Greek or you don't feel confident with it, you can get a lot of the same principles by taking a look at the way different translators have handled the biblical text. In some cases, there's more than one way something can be translated, and so translators will try to bring that out. In other cases, a translator will have a different objective. Some are seeking to replicate the text as close as possibly in the Greek original. Others are seeking to make it as understandable as possible. And my goal for you to do this parallel translation is to give a greater understanding into the biblical text and also trying to identify where are the ways in which scholars differ and how they interpret it. In order to do this, what you should do is in Microsoft Word or whatever document you use, if you can, reorganize the layout. Change it from a portrait to a landscape. That gives you more width, which will help you a lot. You can do that under layout, usually in the menu settings. And then create columns. If you go under underneath the section that's called, uh, again, under layout, you can add under the columns and put four columns there for your four different Bible translations you'll be loading in there. And then that way you can put the information Information. You may need multiple pages, and if you're year wise, you can also do this in Microsoft Publisher and do it automatic where it will feed from one to the other. Uh, if you don't know Publisher, you can just use Word or whatever uh, basic word processing software. But what you want to do is find four different translations. I want one of these to be a more literal translation. You can do two if you want, and then one to be more of a paraphrase. So the example that I have in front of you right here. We use the New American Standard and the King James as our two literal translations. English Standard Version is one sort of in between the New Living Translation as more of a paraphrase. And see what I've done in verses 1 and 2 is I've laid them out and put them in there. And notice it's really tight, but this enables me to go word by word and to do a comparison and see exactly when words are the same and when they are maybe similar or different. Now notice down on the bottom I've got a color coding to help me do that. And that's where if every translation uses the same exact word, I'm going to color them all in green. If it's uh, th if three of the translations are the same, I'm going to color those three in blue, but then do the one that's different in red. And then the same thing if I got two yellow that are the same, I'll put those two that way. And then if they're all similar but not identical, really conveying the same idea, I could do that all highlighted in that light yellow. You can use whatever color you want, just be sure there's some sort of a key so I can tell what you're trying to say. So this is what it looks like when I'm all done. Notice they all use Paul and. 
everything is there, so they're all green. But then you get to Timothy. Three of them use Timothy, but King James takes a more Greek transliteration and says Timotheus, and so that's disagreement. Is it significant? <laughs> Uh, probably not, but you never know when something like that is. And so that's the goal is to find all of these things. Then the next one that might be, notice two of them say servants, the KJV and ESV. NASB says bond servants and NLT says slaves. Now in English, there's a big difference between a slave and a servant. Implication is servants being paid. The servant is voluntary. Slave has no choice in the matter. So this is a word that's probably worth studying. And that's part of why I'm doing this. I want to find out if there's something different here. I want to dive into that word, see what's going on. Next, we see of Jesus Christ. Again, three of the translations say that. Um, uh, no, actually, I said that wrong. Only one said of Jesus Christ. Three say of Christ Jesus. Does the word order matter? I don't know. And again, with all these things, anything you come up with saying, does word order matter? Pull out those I lists I told you about. Any inquiries, anything you want to dig into deeper when you start looking in, into sources, especially commentaries in your later steps of the search, write those down. Turn in your I list every step of the process for me as well. Notice they say to all. Everybody's got to all. Then we say the saints in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Three of them say that. NLT, though, says all of God's holy people. Hmm, that's different. Well, okay, it's significant. I don't know. Might be. You may want to write that one down. Take a look at that. Then who are, to them say who are. Uh, King James says which are. We don't use which for people anymore, so that's a little bit different. Uh, and then we go on down to uh, Philippi. Everybody's using Philippi in there. And then notice that overseers, two of them use the word overseers. KJV uses the word bishops. NLT uses the word elders. Hmm. That's interesting. I mean, there, there are similar sort of, but... What's the connotation there? That would be a word. If I'm only preaching these two verses, that's another word I'm going to want to do a word study on. Find out what it means. How does that work? How does that function in this? Uh, then the next one down there, deacons, they all say deacons. So they're in agreement with deacons, no problem with deacons. It still may be significant for me. I, I can go ahead and do that if I want. Uh, then next one, grace. Everybody says grace. Some say grace to you. King James says be unto you. And then, uh, uh, then at the NLT, it says, give you grace and peace. And then that word peace there, they all say that. And then they all say from God, our father, everybody says that. And they all say in the Lord Jesus Christ. So hopefully you can see how this is helpful to help you identify some things. Note those things. Note the words you want to be studying more. So what I want you to do for this assignment, unless you're going to do the Greek diagrammatic analysis, and that'd be awesome if you do, but for everybody else, I want you to hand in four translations marked in parallel with some sort of a key so I know how you're identifying. If you want to color it or whatever, that's fine. You can hand this in in paper if you like. You can do it electronically. Um, probably electronics would be my recommendation, but but if, if you can, if you want to do, if you just love paper, that's fine. I want at least two of the translations to be more literal, give you a range of possibilities there, New American Standard, King James, New King James, ESV. Uh, then one can be a paraphrase like New Living Translation, Living Bible, CEV, God's Word. You can do the message. I do not recommend it for this exercise. We'll have zero green on there. So, well, maybe a little bit. And then add me. Uh, and when you've done that, figure out which words you're going to study. And then also add a little paragraph. What did you find on this? Is there a lot of agreement? Is there anything that you come up with that seems like, whoa, some of these translations really differ with one another? Anything you want to go deeper in? And again, I write things down on your eye list. You may get inspirations at any point in time along the way. Always be open to the Holy Spirit's voice while you're preparing. You may know now in this study, maybe like, oh, yes, I see. I want to preach that. Write that down on that inspiration list. Uh, maybe some insights. What are you learning from this study? Put that down in there. And then inquiry. What do you want to know more as you go through the process? Well, as I said, your goal from your parallel study or your diagrammatic analysis was to find a few words that are really uh, you want to know more about. And typically these are going to be words that are significant to your passage's meaning. Maybe words that you're not sure what they mean yourself or you find a big variance between Bible translation. And again, watch out for word study fallacies. These include things like... Uh,
every word that is going to have a one-on-one -on -one meaning in English and in Greek. It doesn't it doesn't work that way. Kind of like the word fly in English. How many words? Do you, well, fly can be a bug that flies around. A fly can be mean a verb flying through the air or, or plane. What does plane mean? A plane can be an object that goes through an air. Plane can be ordinary. Can, pain, can be a flat surface. Plane can be a tool that you use to do that. So remember that it doesn't always work on a one-for-one -one basis. And that's why this study process is so important. So to do a word study, start out by determining the words you want to study. Once you've got that word, then determine what the original language word is. What is it in Greek for doing the New Testament? Then determine the semantic range. That's a big word that just means all the range of possible meanings for that Greek word, not the English equivalent. Remember the Greek word. Once you've discovered the full range, then look it up in a lexicon. That's a big word for a dictionary that is going to be going in a little bit deeper and for a foreign language. And then once you've done that, then determine the range of possible meanings for your passage. The word you pick may have 10 total different translations that you came up with in your semantic range, but only three or four are actually going to work in your passage. Okay, then take a look at those and look at what would, what would the impact of option A mean? What would the impact of option B mean? What would the impact of option C? And then once you've done that today, I'm going to go with C. I think C is the one that me makes the most sense in the context of my passage. So I'm going to go into a little more depth with each of these steps and just say, as we talked about, you word you want to study is going to be one that's crucial to your passage's meaning, maybe repeated often, maybe a figure of speech, something that's unclear, puzzles you, difficult, again, or may vary between translation. Uh, now, one, the next step of the process can either be done using a book called a concordance. Some of you have seen those. Strong's is the most famous. Uh, there's several others that are out there that you can buy. The Strong's is built around the old King James Version. So if you use it, just remember, you're going to need to reference the King James. But there's a lot of good Strong's out there. I've got one in my office. And they all tend to work similarly. All explain that process as if you're using Strong's. There may be a slight variance between some of the others. However, I'm going to recommend that you use Bible software because it will save you time. The vast majority of preachers use Bible software. Why not use some good tools? I'm going to walk through a process again verbally, kind of letting you know how this might work. So the semantic range, as I said, is all the different possible meanings of the Greek word. Uh, one of the ways to do that, to start with that, if you're using a concordance or even a Bible search software, is to look at how many different ways does it get translated into English in our Bibles. Now, no, that is probably not the full semantic range. That may be the range of biblical use in a given translation, but first century Greeks may have used it in other ways as well. So just be aware of that. But what I do want you to do is to see how it gets used in the Bible by a variety of writers. Remember, Paul may have used it differently than Luke did, than Matthew did, than John did, than Peter did. And so it can be beneficial to just see how it gets used. And, and what I, I'm going to walk you through a process of that and, and have you kind of do a, probably about a page each on each of your three words you're going to study. If you choose to do this using a concordance, you will find that most concordance are divided up with a front section and a back section. And what a front section does, it is listed in alphabetical order of the English word used in that translation. So you go through and you'll find that particular English word and you'll have a, a series of every time it gets used in that translation, you'll see on the left side of the column, it will give you the book, the, the uh, chapter and verse, and then a brief summary, typically summarized with that particular word, only the first letter showing up. Then over on the right side, you will see a number. That number is the coding that they use for that original language word, either Greek or Hebrew. So then you go to the back of your concordance it will typically, the first of the back sections will be in Hebrew. The, the last part will be in Greek. It's a lot shorter, but it does give you that. Then you want to look up the number and find out when you go through with the number. And then after you've done that, you will see, and first in the original language, uh, 
fonts, so either the Greek lettering or the Hebrew lettering, and then you will see what's called a transliteration. They are writing how probably it was pronounced in English letters. So write that down on your paper. If you want to do the, the Greek, that's fine too. Then you will see a brief pronunciation, some derivations for it, and then all of a sudden you will see the number of ways it gets used in the uh, New Testament or the Old Testament in that translation. And you want to write down every one of those words there and typically the ones that actually get used are done in italics although this can vary from from word to word and concordance to concordance so whatever you find in there write down each of those meetings this is the start of that meeting then you want to go back to the front section and look up each meaning of each of those words and find uh, several sections there and you will see some words will have hundreds and literally thousands of occurrences in the Bible others will only have one if you want to know a Greek trivia word it's called hapax legomena which means it's spoken once and HL for short means it only occurs once in the whole Bible and that's way easier if you're going to do a word study like this but again don't just limit yourself to that so find a way uh, uh, pick your three words and do this for each of those and find the range of ways it gets translated in the English Bible. As I said, when you go through the front section, find a scripture reference for each way it gets used, and then read over that passage in the Bible to just take a look at, okay, how does the word mean there, function there? How is that functioning there? And then go through and pick some others. You want to do that with every possible English translation of your Greek word. You may only have one, you may have 20, but whatever it is, again, get your, your goal here is to get a feel for how this word gets used throughout the New Testament. Each time you do this, write down the reference to the scriptures that you were looking up. I want you to do this at least 10 times. If your word gets translated more than 10 different ways in your translation, please do all of those. Um, and 30 would be way more than enough. I don't think you'll run into that. But you, what you may find is you only have two or three. I still want you to look at 10 different verses throughout the New Testament. And if so, focus on how it gets used in your passage and by your passage's authors. As we're going through Philippians, look at some other ways Paul uses that. Once you've done that, I want you to make a list of the possible English words that that could translate that Greek word. And, and don't just limit yourselves to the way it gets used in your translation. Think through what are some other Greek words that would, or English words that would be synonyms for these ideas you come up with. Just come up with as many as you can, write them out or type them out on your sheet that you're going to hand in. And this is your word semantic range. Key part of this process. That's how you do it using a concordance. Now you may decide you would rather use Bible software. Again, this really will save you some time. And if you want to do one word with a concordance, just do it and now do some with the software. That would be awesome. That's great. There is some free software available and it's good if you're on a tight budget. It's not wonderful. I have I use Logos all the time. I've used PC Bi Study Bible in the past. I love Logos. Another one I use is called Gramcord. Um, it doesn't have as many side resources. It hasn't been update in a few decades, but it's great for original language use, but nothing compares to Logos and I've used. I know some people love Accordance. BibleSoft is another one. Uh, you get what you pay for, and a, a lot, especially eSword is an app you have to download from the website, and it will stay resident on your computer. Blue Letter Bible is fully web-based. Both of those have made some upgrades in recent years, and have given you some tools, and you can do some searches on them. eSword is really built around the King James, and you uses the, the Strong's uh, numbering system for that, but because it's an app, there are some things it can do that Blue Letter Bible can't, but they both work pretty well uh, and will do some of the principles that we want to have. Logos and, and these others that you pay for, you, you can buy more and more resources. You can buy uh, incredible commentaries at significant discounts because you don't have to have paper form. It's all electronic. The resources you get are incredible. The study tools you get are absolutely phenomenal, and, and so it, it's a lot more. I, I recommend it. If you envision yourself preaching, and especially if you want to be a Bible preacher, preaching exegetically through your career, this is an investment in your career, and it would be well worth it for you to do that. Uh, we actually will be getting a free version of Logos came and uh, their publishers came and talked to uh, Dr. Dale Mignon and Dr. Archer a few weeks ago. So you probably will be 
offered a, a free entry level version of Logos here in the next few weeks uh, that you may want to use. Again, I recommend it, but I will accept Blue Letter Bible or eSword as well. Now, Bible Gateways one I use, a lot of other people use. It's great for English language searching, but it is not as good for the kind of original language work we're going to be doing. Now, each electronic uh, Bible translation software is going to be slightly different in how it works, but let me give you just basically the process. And again, it parallels what we were trying to do with the concordance. Number one, you want to figure out what's the original language word for the word that you want to study. And you start out by uh, looking up your passage in your software, in your preferred translation, so that you can find that word. Once you get over it, you typically are gonna do something like either right click over it and you'll get a menu that'll pop up or maybe you'll left click on it. Uh, and some of these, like in, uh, I think it's an eSword, you actually have to do a full on breakdown, actually blue letter Bible as well, and it'll bring it over in the menu and then you can just click on it and it'll pop up over there. You can see what the original language word is then once you've done that you you one way or another will have some sort of a search feature some may have you go to another menu where you have to pull up that Greek word but once you've done that you click on it all of a sudden you'll get a list of every passage in the New Testament uses that Greek word and that that just saved you so many hours of work in the concordance it's incredible and it's a great way to do that now what I want you to do is to walk through that list and again like we were going to do with the concordance find at least 10 passages that use that Greek word as you would do if you would use a concordance, you want to look up every unique word in English that gets translated from that Greek word and just kind of get a feel for how they get used, as well as several other ways the word gets used, especially if it's used uh, as, as it's used in your particular passage. Once you've done that, write down each reference and then just a brief statement about how you see it used there, give you kind of a range of ideas that may or may not add on to your understanding what the word means. But I want you to do this first in the scriptures themselves and, and get a feel for that before jumping into the lexicon. But then you would want to look up a lexicon. You probably have one available on your electronic uh, software. And I have a great one in Logos. I have the ultimate one right there. Uh, but you can find some other ones. And then list as many English words as you can think of that could convey the range of the meanings of the Greek words. And this is what we call the semantic range. I'm saying either way, you want to use a good lexicon. Maybe a, you may hear the word dictionary, something like that. The ultimate is Kittel's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. It's now old, but uh, it, it is unbelievably massive with an incredible amount of detail uh, going into the meaning of words. Uh, again, I've got it electronically. You can get it in the library. Uh, there are other good ones. Bauer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich has been kind of the industry standard. It is a single volume, but it is hefty and expensive. But if you're going to be a student, it may be worth it to invest in one or the other of those. Uh, the others on the list are single volumes, a little more price uh, achievable. Uh, Vines is not necessarily great. It's definitely not at a scholarly level. Mounts, uh, Verbrugge, Zadiades are, are kind of targeted towards intense lay people, but also work well for pastors. And as you go through the process, always be open for insights, inquiries, and inspirations. Continue to add to the list as you go. As I mentioned in the uh, other slides, whenever you uh, get to this point in the process, you've worked through the Word, you've seen how it's been used throughout the New Testament, you've read what the experts say, you should have a good handle on the what the Word means. Now think about that from your semantic range list and then we'll read your passage again. What you'll probably find is not every meaning is going to work in your passage because of the context. And so you can eliminate some of those. In fact, the easiest way to do it is just cut and paste your semantic range list, pull out anything that obviously is not going to work, but then find out, okay, what do you see, what might work and put those few items there and then take a look at how would it impact you there? And you can just do this in a in a quick paragraph and just say, okay, uh, the, these three meanings might work in my passage, but what do you think? Would they change the meaning? You may say, well, this one here would end up implying something different. If so, identify that. You may say, well, they're all kind of synonyms. It's going to be the same. That's that's fine to do. But by the end, I just say, this is the word I think best would be used in my particular text. Identify that at the end of your sheet. You should take about one page to do each of these. 
I'm going to do a couple of samples to show you what a word study works like and how you might do that. I'm not going to do it in full detail, but give you some ideas of how you could proceed. I'll pick two words from uh, my passage, from verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1, that we found that there was some range in the way that they were interpreted by different translators. First one we're going to pick is the word overseer, bishop, or elder. Notice it with the four translations used it three different ways. So that says, hmm, there might be something there. Let's take a look at it. And so what I'm going to do is to look up in my paper concordance <clears throat> uh, it, the English word in the translations that I'm using. So I'm going to use Strong's Concordance. That means I need to go to the front section of the concordance and, and look up that King James word. And as I go back and look and see what it was in King James, it's the word bishops. So here's a picture of the front cover of my Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible. And the top, notice it says main concordance. That's the biggest piece. It's the front piece. When I turn to that section and go alphabetically in English, I go to the B's and look down and see bishops right there. See where it is circled there on the left? And notice I see Philippians abbreviated, 1-1, one, one, Philippi with the B, and then this little thing for abbreviation. Then over on the right, I get that number, 1985. That's what we call the Strong's number. So what I do is I need maybe to write that down, remember it, and now I'm going to flip to the back to the Greek dictionary section. When I flip to the back and, and look for it there, then I want to find the number of different English words that gets translated from that Greek word. This is what the top part of that Greek dictionary of the New Testament, the very last section of Strong's looks like. And when I look down at 1985 on the left, I see the number there. Then I see the Greek letters that pronounce the word episkopos. Then notice in yellow there I have the English letters, actually Latin, but we can call it English because that makes more sense to show you how it gets uh, what we call a transliterated. If I'm going to pronounce it correctly in English, uh, that's those are the letters that I would use. And you get another pronunciation there. And it said from what it's sourced, the numbers that it's drawn from. And it's two of them. Epi, which means over, and scopos, which means look at. Like scope, you ever look at a telescope? That's where it comes from. And so you got right there. And notice there it says in a superintendent, one words. That is a CHRS, officer, Christian officer, in general charge of a or the church, either literally or figuratively. That's what we call a Strong's definition. Very abbreviated. Don't use that for your lexicon. It does not count. I'll deduct points. But what is significant is it shows the number of, of it gives every word that that Greek word gets translated in into the English King James Version. Notice there are just two. Bishop and overseer. I need to write down each of these and remember them and then go back to the front section to see how many times this word appears throughout the New Testament. So here's my section where I wrote it down. Notice I wrote down episkopos. Episkopos. Have you heard of the Episcopalian Church? That's where it comes from. And underneath there say it's translated as either bishop or overseer in the King James. Once I've done that, I need to go back to the front section and find a scripture reference for each word. So I need to look at first bishop and then overseer and to see how it gets used in every one of those translations and occurrences. If there's more than 10, you don't need to read more than 10. If there's less than 10, read all of them. If there's more than 10, I still want you to see every word that it gets translated into English. And that may possibly be more than 10, not very often is that the case. And the goal here is to get a feel for how does it get used throughout the Bible. So when I go to the front section here, under bishop, back same page I was at before, notice over on the right, we have some that are 1984 and some that are 1985. Now, technically, you don't need to look up 1984, but guess what it means that those numbers are close to each other? It means they're related. There's something close there. Often, it's one's an adjective or a verb and the other's a noun, um, or one's one form of the word and another. So it doesn't hurt to look up all those, but what I want to hold you to is the exact number. So 198. 
8, 5. So the first time we see it there is in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. It says, a B, which is a bishop, then must be blameless. So I need to go and look that up and pull it up there, and I'll see it's a list of the requirements of somebody who's going to serve as a bishop. Then we see 2 Timothy, and it says it's a subscript. It says, Timotheus ordained the first B or bishop. Now, because it's a subscript, guess what? It was added on by the editors of the King James. It was not found in the original uh, Bible scroll from the first century. So I would not need you to look up for that. However, it is significant because the editors of the King James felt like Tim was a, a bishop and that matched his role. Okay, that's fine. And then we see Titus 1.7. And similar to 1 Timothy 3.2, says a bishop must be blessed blameless as going on there. Very similar. And if we see those are parallel passages, slightly different in some of the details, but Timothy and Titus were doing similar things, appointing leaders over the churches, including bishops. So they were overseers who were appointing other overseers to get manage the churches in those particular regions. And then the next one, as we go down, another subscription, again, added by the King James editors. Then below that, 1 Peter 2.25, and it says, talks about Jesus, who is the shepherd and the bishop of your soul. So there's an idea. This time it's referring to Jesus. And what is he overseeing? Hmm, he's overseeing my soul. And so I would, again, look up that passage, see all of it there in context. And then the only other occurrence is bishop is in plural, and that's in Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, which is, ha, huh, my passage that I'm studying. So after seeing all the occurrences of bishops, I now need to go to overseers. And what I see there is notice a whole bunch of really different numbers on the right. 5,329, that's nothing like 1985, but guess what? It's in Second Chronicles, so it's not even a Greek word. It's a Hebrew word, doesn't match. I don't want to look at those. We're only looking at the New Testament. It's got to be the original language. I've had students give me Old Testament words before. It's like, nope, you're missing it. That's not the point. It's 1985 which only occurs once, Acts 20, verse 28. And it says, Add the Holy Ghost hath made you O, being short for overseers. If you go and read that passage, which you will need to do, you will see as Paul is addressing the overseers of the church at Ephesus, calling to meet him in Miletus, and he gives them some important instructions uh, about things that are going on there. And notice, they were appointed Paul doesn't say by him, although he appointed people. He said it was the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, who was the one who had made them overseers. A lot of responsibilities there. So what I want to do now is look up, again, every occurrence, because there's only a handful for this one, but if, at least 10 if, if there's more, and then write down each reference, make a little bit of a comment to show how it was used when you look up each of those, and then eventually go and look up uh, your Greek word in a good Greek-English lexicon and mark anything else you find that's significant. So now I'm writing down my five occurrences I found, all five, every time the word episkopos occurs in the New Testament. And then I'm not going to do it here, but I want you to write down a brief sentence or two along each of these after you've looked up that scripture passage. So like I've said, first one, there is a, a list of, of requirements for somebody who's going to serve as a bishop or an overseer. Uh, there's a lot in that verse. I love verse one and two. It says if somebody aspires that office, it's a good work they desire to do, but here's some things that have to be true about them. The Titus passage is also very similar. Notice both Timothy and Titus were charged with appointing people who are going to serve in this role. So what we can tell about that, it's a role of supervisory authority, but there's this other role mentioned, deacon. And notice, ironically, in Philippians 1.1, both of those are mentioned there. So there's two different roles, seems to be two different offices, different people have them, and it's not just one person serving in that role. So it's pretty significant there for that. Uh, and then we will see that it, it doesn't describe as much what they do as it is what kind of person they are supposed to be. And we jump down to 1 Peter 2, as we saw there, it's talking about Jesus being the overseer of our souls. And as we saw in Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, this is our text, the one that we are using. We can make some comments. In fact, it's in plural is significant. Again, companion with those who are serving as deacons. But what's interesting here is that is Paul addresses all of the saints in the church in Philippi along with 
and mentions them out specifically. They would have been included in there. They weren't different. And yet it's somehow Paul is recognizing them. That might be significant. And then Acts 20, 28, as we saw Paul is addressing those who are in leadership in that position from the church in Ephesus. Now I need to go and find a good lexicon. The one I've chosen is the one that has been the industry standard for a long time called Bauer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich. Uh, it does not work too well if you don't read Greek. So I'll just let you know that. It's all done in Greek alphabet. There's a lot of stuff in English, but some stuff in Greek there as well. So give you an idea on this one. Again, you can use those Hyades, Verbrugge, I'll even accept Vines, but I want you to dig into something built around the the Greek word. Now, what's significant here, this one goes uh, a full column on one side of the page into the other a little bit. And as we take a look in here, I'm not going to read everything, but some of the things that are, are significant here, in, it was used in pre-Christian usage. It means somebody who watches over a guardian. Uh, that's an interesting word idea concept there. Uh, it says that these are guardians of agreements. They have the responsibility of safeguarding or seeing to it something that is done in the career correct way. Uh, so obviously it's somebody who's in charge to make sure everything is done the way it's supposed to be done. Now, once you've read the concordance, and I want you to make a note of what concordance you use, anything you find that's significant in there, add that to the sheet, and then come up with a list of possible English words that that word could translate into. Yes, whatever you find in the Bible, but go beyond that. Think about it. You've got an idea of what this word means now. What do you think? What, what kind of things could that word be used for? So you're getting the feel for what episkopos could mean. Uh, and I came up with uh, eight words, seven words here, and we really could go on because there's a lot of stuff in our world today that matches this concept. Certainly overseer, the word there, bishop, yeah, those are good church words. But think about it, it's a supervisor, it's a manager, it's a boss, it's administrator, the person who's going to make it happen, the director. We already saw guardian come out of, of the Bauer Dictionary there. So there's this idea, see the range of possible meanings for episkopos. Now we go back to our biblical text and take a look. It range, if I chose one word or another, how is that going to affect what this word means? Well, the interesting thing here is there's not a huge range of difference of meaning. Although when you think of the word bishop, if you grew up in a church where a bishop was a title, you may have one idea of one particular level, when in reality, what is it? You're, you're responsible for making sure things get done. You're in charge. You're a boss. So idea there, and as we look at it in context, obviously somebody is in charge of the church. And what I find especially interesting, I mentioned this before, is it's plural. As far as we know, there's one, Paul writes like he's writing to a church, one church, but there's a plural of overseers. Most churches in America today, there's the lead pastor, the one who's in charge there. Uh, there are a few churches that have a plurality of leaders, but that's kind of rare. So that's something significant that could have some impact as we reflect on this particular text. Are you enjoying this so far? Hopefully you found that beneficial. Well, let me go with the way I'm going to recommend you do that, and that is by using software. This time we're going to pick a different word from my text, and that was one that had a range of translations. Uh, some translated it servant, some bond servant, one translated it slave. And remember, these are Paul's description of himself, a servant, a bond servant, a slave of Christ Jesus. So now again, uh, this time I go and open up my Bible software, and I'm, again, I'm going to show you what it looks like in Logos. You can go and use the Blue Letter Bible or eSword if you want to use that or uh, Accordance, whatever you choose to use. And then you pull up that software and then there's going to be some way of bringing up an index that's going to connect that with the original language word. There should be some way to do some sort of a search with it. This is what it looks like on my Logos uh, Silver Edition. I actually have two separate columns. You can see part of the Greek over there on the right. We're focusing in on the English because I'm assuming you haven't had Greek. Uh, those of you who had, you're very welcome to use that and you'll find it to be very beneficial. And so I'm looking right there. What's my word? Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus. So NAS says bond servants is the word. That's the one I want to use. 
This is what I see when I right click on it. It pops up a little sub menu and gives me lots of choices of things that I can do on it. Notice over here on the right, it already has the Greek word for me if I want to look at it, a brief definition of it, other things that I can do. It even has a Strong's number. I can have that Bible word study option. I'll show you what that does. It's incredible. The power lookup's really cool. Pronounce it, it'll even read it for you. But what I'm going to do right now is under the search, see it highlighted there, it says morph doulos. When it says morph, it means any form of the word. That's what morphe is the form. And, and so it will take it, and, and part of the challenge you run into in English, words don't change that much except in, in when they're verb form, whereas most other languages, the, the exact spelling is going to differ depending on how many people it involves, if it's plural, if it's singular, future, past, present, male, masculine, feminine, neuter, whatever, all these kinds of things. So this morph search feature does everything that's a version of that word that we can use. Once I've clicked on the morph search, on the other side, I get to see a list of every occurrence of that word, doulos, that occurs in the New Testament. And notice the column here, it says the resource, that's a translation that they're using because that's when I clicked out of it. The reference, that's the biblical reference. First one there is Matthew 8, 9. And then the previous context, the result, and the next context. So a few words before, how it gets translated, and then a few words after that. Uh, the form there, and that that's, a, it, again, if you opened it wider, it would spell it all out, the whole Greek word there, showing which Strong's letter it uses and going on there. So this is a way for me to very quickly, with a single click, see every occurrence in the New Testament. And, and because doulos occurs so many times, notice up there, 126 different times in the New Testament, 118 verses. It's going to go on, 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 on. I, you're not going to make you look up 126 results. I want you to look up 10. Now, if you remember, we had that option, the Bible word study was an option. And if you clicked it, this is what you would see. Uh, and this is only one piece. It's actually going to take three slides that we could go on deeper, deeper, deeper with us in that. Uh, and so, again, it's got the pronunciation right there. It has a little chart that shows how it gets used throughout the New Testament, where it occurs most often. You notice Matthew uses it a lot, and then a little bit over there in Acts, and then it's throughout the, the, the epistles, uh, how it gets translated briefly. The TDNT, if you click on that right there, that's going to open up the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament definition. I'm going to show that to you later because it's incredible. You've got more options there of things you can pull on. Then you got the translation. It gives you the range of ways it gets translated into the New American Standard. If I pull this out of NIV, it would do that. The blue says, those are the occurrences of the word slave. The red is for the bond servant or bond servants. The orange is for bond slave, and then servants are very rarely used in there. So notice how that occurs like that. Keep going down that chart, then it gives me the range of different ways that it gets used of, and it, as it occurs, the different derivations of the word, how it gets translated, and where that gets used throughout the New Testament, and the number of occurrences. Then we keep going down there, it gives me a few example uses in different forms uh, of parts of the sentence, the subject versus the object. Keep going, we will see how it gets used with different prepositions. And if you study Greek, you'll understand how important the prepositions are. Huper, which means over, pros, into, ek, out of. And, and those are some of the ways you can do it right there. Meta, which would be with. Uh, and then so you can do some searches there of how it gets used in the Old Testament as well to give you an idea of what, uh, what Paul and the other writers of the New Testament would have had in mind had they been reading the Greek New Testament. Old Testament. I know that's a lot of stuff. Let me tell you, there's a lot of stuff you can do with Bible software. But what I want you to do is, again, find at least 10 passages that contain your Greek word uh, there. And then be sure you find every unique occurrence. Uh, and then if, if, if you've got enough space left, several occurrences of the word that gets translated in your passage, write down each reference and a short comment of how it is used. I'm not taking time to do that for doulos right here. What I will show you, though, is what the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, the entry, looks like. This is just the beginning here on the left side. shows doulos and then other words related to doulos that are all put together. And, and I love, I love 
who was sometimes called Kittle for short, because he was the first German writer who put this together. He didn't do it all himself. He, he put together the greatest minds in New Testament scholarship. It is a bit dated, but it is still massive and has not yet been touched and a lot of great background. And what it does, it would go on for about 12 to 14 pages on just this word, just the word doulos. And there's so much stuff that shows how it was used in the Greek world before the, even the Greek Old Testament was translated, how it was used in the secular world of the first century and even by early Christians, shows how it was used by the Greek Old Testament as well as the Hebrew Old Testament in words that the Greek Old Testament translated, then it spends a lot of time focusing on the New Testament, how it gets used there, the range of possible meanings for how it could be used, anything that's significant that's going to help us understand it. And it is incredible the kind of things that you can pull out of uh, an in-depth theological lexicon like this. I'm giving you ex two examples right here. These are direct quotes from Kittle. And, and let me just say, the first one is in response a lot of times, and I've heard so many great sermons talk about, and even the NAS translates it, bond servant. The idea of somebody who voluntarily makes himself a servant for someone else. And there's a, a pattern of that in the Old Testament, someone who has served their time as a slave, they now could go free, but they go back and choose to go back to their master and say, hey, I don't want to be free. I want to continue to serve you. And that the master would take their ear and take an awl, that's like an ice pick, and drive it through the their ear into the doorpost of the house to show this person's my slave forever, but they chose to do it willingly. And it sounds awesome. And, and, and you know, it could be that that was Paul's heart, but that is not how the word doulos gets used according to Kittle. Listen to this quote. Hence, we have a service which it is not a matter of choice for the one who renders it, which he has to perform whether he likes it or not, because he is subject as a slave to an alien will to the will of his owner. And that's what it says about that Greek word doulos. Later on, he goes on to say about how it gets used in the New Testament. The word group serves to describe the relation of an absolute dependence in which the total commitment of the doulos, which is a servant or slave, I should say, on the one side corresponds to the total claim of the curios, Lord, on the other. And, and again, that shows that, that pattern. And I think that's why Paul uses this wording. Of all the words he could use to describe himself as he introduces himself in his letters, this one he chooses more than any other, a doulos, a slave of Christ Jesus. So now, again, using the, the Bible software to determine the semantic range is very similar to what we would do with with a concordance. We want to list as many English words that can convey the range of meanings we think that this Greek word can have. And this becomes a semantic range. And it's always good to list all the ones that you find as you do your parallel study. Slave, servant, bond servant. And we just don't find that many other words translated there. So the question is, could it be an employee? Somebody who voluntarily serves? As we go, we saw from the definition in Kittle, um, not really. It's not somebody who has a choice in the matter. It's slave seems to be the best word based on what we discovered. So now I want to see what, what are the impact of the possible range of meanings um, we just keep getting back to that. I like the Old Testament imagery, and that might be a possibility there, but that's not what that word conveys. That word conveys absolute property of Jesus Christ with no rights to himself. Jesus is Paul's master. Paul is Jesus' slave. That's the end of the story. What's the significance? <laughs> that's, that's pretty huge. Pretty huge on the meaning of our text. So what I want you to do is to identify at least three words from your passage in Philippians uh, that you think are appropriate for study. Again, words that you may find a range of different meanings, feel important to the text. It's not clear. You think, man, my sermon might hinge on this. Dig, just pick them out. Identify them. They have about one sheet for each of these. You can use software or concordance. And then first thing I want you to do is mark for me the Greek word. You can transliterate into English. If you want to use Greek, if you know Greek, that's cool. You can do that. And then identify the range of English words that are used to translate this word. 
Uh, that is uh, what, what occurs in your translation, maybe in others, things like that. And then again, find the other New Testament passages, find at least 10 of them. I want you to look it up in some sort of expository dictionary or lexicon, uh, cite the source and give a brief summary of what you find and discover in that. Then come up with the semantic range, all possible meanings for the Greek word. Then I want you to go back to your passage in Mark, and you can even use an asterisk or something on your sheet that you're going to hand in. Show me which ones would actually work in your text. Then do a brief discussion. What do you think? What? How would they impact your meaning? Is there any difference in that? You may or may not find that's the case. Just think, come up with what you think is the best translation for your passage. Now, it doesn't have to be written out in sentence form. In fact, it, can, it probably is better and clearer if you just have kind of like entries there, uh, references, summaries. It doesn't have to be full sentences, but it does need to show you did your work and you knew what you were doing. So over spring break, and you're going to be doing your parallel translation study, your word study on three words, and then go on, and you don't have to hand this in right away, but I'm going to share this with you now so you can be working on it if you're one of the super ambitious people. I want you to look up the historical, cultural, and the literary context of your passage, uh, and, and take a look at the... Uh, um, the the book, the Duval and Hayes book, and if you use that one in Herm, that probably could be real helpful. You probably already did some of this, but the historical cultural context, I want you to look at things that apply to your passage. You can look at stuff for the whole book too if you want, but I really want you to see some things for your passage. As you're reading through your text, you've done your observations, what do you see? What are some questions you have? What are some things that, uh, it just seems to be unique. Is there any customs that are referred to there? Any geographical, political references? Some connections with other Bible verses? Anything that maybe, why is Paul writing this? What kind of things might be happening there? Anything that would help you better interpret and, and explain your pet ta Bible text, know what's going on there. And of course, along the way, anything you find, continue. Go back to that inquiry list. Remember my I list I told you to do? Any of those questions, now is the time to start getting those answered too. To do this study, I want you to use at least three sources. Two of these are not commentaries. In other words, when you get into some different stuff, here's some ideas, and there are a lot in our library. You can use stuff down in the reference section. They have some stuff available online. You don't have to use the one I'm showing you, but here's some ideas. The first concept are, would be a, a dictionary but an in-depth dictionary. It's gonna give you way, way into the background. I love this series from IVP. They first came out about 20 years ago and they've been continuing to release them since. Uh, they're usually related to specific parts of the Bible. So this would be Dictionary of Paul and his letters would be what you would wanna do. Not a lot of entries in there, but when you find something, it's going to go deep. So you can take a look at one of those. Another type of source that's really good to use is what we call a primary source. It was written in the same time period we're taking a look at. These are the two most famous primary sources for the later New Testament. They were written by Roman writers, Roman scholars, Tacitus, who does a history of, of the early Roman emperors, and Suetonius does a very similar thing writing a little bit later. They both talk about the growth of the Christian church, and neither of them liked the growth of the Christian church. In fact, it's some really good evidence for uh, a, a counter perspective to show where Christianity was growing and being in, influential. You may want to look at what we call a secondary source. These are written by current day scholars who've gone back and researched the history, the archaeology, taking a look at things, and usually they're answering questions of a more topical nature that expand beyond just a single book of the Bible. This one, for example, takes a look at what does Paul do when he's in prison? What was he experiencing? What was prison life like for him? And how would that have formed not just the writing of Philippians, but all of the letters of this prison epistle? Similar, this is one of my favorite scholars, Michael Gorman, gradable theologian, New Testament scholar, and he talks about what is Paul's theology and how does that affect how he writes. So again, this is spreading more trans things that, that go beyond just the individual letter, but how does Paul write? What are his main ideas, his main concept and theologically that he's talking about? If you like archaeology, you can get a book about the archaeology of the city of Philippi. And you may or may not find something interesting, relevant there, but it can be incredibly fascinating to see what our archaeologists have discovered. 
And of course, it's nothing like a good peer-reviewed journal article. And so there's a lot of different questions that uh, that people can raise and, and bring up there that you can find incredibly helpful. So here's just a sample. Could Philippians have been written from the second Roman imprisonment? Um, and one thing about peer-reviewed journal articles, they're way shorter than books. They get to the point. They have good summaries and they have incredible bibliographies that can give you a lot of other sources to read later. And also we have uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of these available online through our library. And I'm sure you all know how to use the Bible uh, databases to search for journal articles. We also want to look at the literary context, which involves two different things. One of them is the context of the writing of the book as a whole. So that's the first piece right there. Who wrote it? Who were the readers? When was it written? Why was it written? What was going on in the world at the time and in the lives of both the writer and the readers that motivated that writing? But there's a literary context beyond that question is how does this book connect with the rest of the New Testament, both thematically and chronologically, but also how does this book work within itself and how does your passage interact with the passages before and after it? What are the major themes? You saw those book threads through your study. Which of those does your passage connect with and how does it inform that? Um, and also remember, this is a letter. You may be, if you're doing some of the early or the later stuff, there are aspects of Philippians being a letter that give reason for it being written the way it is. Why Paul starts the ver two verses I'm looking at it are there because it's a letter. And, and so how does that affect how I would interpret it that? So what I want you to do for your context studies assignment is to complete both a historical and a literary context study on just your passage. The way I just described it here, as well as what you see in the Duval and Hayes book and the Carter Duval and Hayes book. I want to see at least three sources for the historical context study, cite them in Turabian. Uh, there must be references there, good bibliography. Um, two of them must be other than commentaries. The whole study, the whole paper needs to be three to five pages. And yes, that's three to five double spaced pages. So for the literary context, I want you to answer the basic questions of the whole book, author, recipient, state, locations, and the range of opinions on that, and there are many. And then also talk about how your passage fits into the flow of the whole book, which book link threads you connect with, how it connects before and after. And then if we have come up with a discernment series by then, a thread for that, tell how, how do you think what would be a good topic for your particular passage? And talk about that right there. And then for the historical context, give me something uh, specific to your text itself. I need there to be at least two of them that you reference with your sources. I know this is a lot of work, but again, I want you to be diving deep into this Bible passage like you've never done before. I want it to be swimming inside of you. I want you to have a good, good grasp on it. And these are great skills. They're going to help you really understand what Paul was writing, what the Holy Spirit said to the church then, and what the Holy Spirit wants to say to the people to whom you're going to preach when you preach this text. Well, God bless. I hope you have a wonderful spring break.